especially, you know, if, if um, for every one ayah, there's 20, 30 tafasir easily accessible. <laughs> that means a few hundred pages per ayah and 600 pages of a book with, I mean, forget it. I'm never going to get through this. You see what I'm saying? So you, you can get overly intimidated. The approach, the, the, a systematic approach is you take one surah, hopefully a shorter one, relatively shorter. So I would say between the 26th juz to the 30th juz. That's an easy place to start. You pick a surah, you listen to a lecture on that surah. If it's, especially if it's like a page and a half, two pages long, it's not that long, right? So you listen to a lecture on that surah, and you don't listen to that lecture and move on to the next lecture. One of the problems of our time, times is that we have so many lectures and so many materials available that we're just flooded, right? So you listen to one thing and you say, I already heard this one, let me listen to the next one, and the next one, and the next one. And what that does is, actually you don't retain anything. You, you just keep moving on and you have really very little recollection of what you heard. So what you want to do is you want to listen to the same lecture four, five, six times. While you're doing this, maybe it takes you a month, I don't know. While you're doing this, you're memorizing the surah. You're, the same surah you'll be listening to lectures about. You know what's going to happen? Almost subconsciously, you're going to develop a word-for-word -word vocabulary of that surah in the context of the ayahs being explained. When you make a list of words and try to memorize the meanings, when you try to kind of read the English translation over and over again, you're going to forget. There's no doubt about it. But if the Qur'an is presented in a conversation, in a flowing discussion, and the themes are discussed, and all of that, it starts sinking. Especially if you memorize those ayat. And the, all of this process, you haven't even introduced Arabic study in any of this yet. You're just listening to a basic lecture and kind of uh, uh, fall, trying to memorize those ayat, right? This is short term. All of this is short term. Long term, you want to get into Arabic studies. And my theory is there are, you know, th there are different kinds of students. There are students that have a lot of time on their hands and they can do more. There are people that are really busy with, you know, maybe you're an engineering student or medical student, I don't know, or you've got a job and you just don't have time, so, you know, 15, 20 minutes a day. So there, in my theory, there should be a curriculum for people who want to put in a couple of hours. There should be another curriculum for people who only have 20 minutes, you know, and they don't have every day, they have three days a week, things like that. That's kind of the the thinking behind the Arabic with Husna curriculum that some of you might be familiar with, right? So that would be a good, that's a long-term strategy. You get through a few units of that, of that while you're memorizing surahs, while you're listening to lectures of surahs, it'll all start synergizing. It'll all start compiling in one place. And it's a really meaningful way to move forward with Qur'an instead of saying, I'm going to learn all the vocabulary of Surah Al-Baqarah, for example. Even though you learn the vocabulary of Surah Al-Baqarah, which may or may not be long term, chances are you're not going to memorize all of it anytime soon. And on top of that, a month later, if I ask you the same vocabulary, guess what? It's not going to be there. This is what happens to you when you study for your, any other exams, like, you know, biology exams or chemistry exams. Do you, you remember the terms a month after the exam, two months after the exam? No. It's gone. Well, the same thing's going to happen to the Qur'an. It's not some mystical thing that's going to keep that vocabulary inside you. But the, so that, that method really helped me a lot. And that's kind of my motivation for putting those resources in place. A lecture series on the entire Qur'an, slow 20 minutes a day type of Arabic studies that can get you to a pretty serious point, inshaAllah yeah. ta'ala. Yeah, yeah, on bayina.tv. And that's one of the main intentions of that, so to help Muslims develop a sustained relationship with the Qur'an. The YouTube things, they're, they're cool and they're, they're like beneficial, I think, but they're not going to be a steady learning resource. Learning happens when you go systematically and you kind of take a library kind of approach, you know? So, any other questions before I start? Well, it's already time, but might as well. You, Muzammil, I can't allow you to ask questions, I'm sorry. This is unacceptable. Remember I told you to come to dinner with me last night and you said no? Yeah. Yeah, you broke my heart, and therefore, you don't get to ask. Uh, no, I'm kidding. Go ahead, ask your question. <laughs> so, uh, at Bayanah TV, uh, the Quran of Sir, it goes from Father to the last word. So, if, if yani, do we have to stick on, uh, stick on this structure? No, 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 you pick which ones you like. Pick, pick Surah Al-Hujrat. Is there like a link, like you're, maybe you're explaining Surah Al-Muzamad, and then... <laughs> what a surprise. <laughs> Put in stuff from what you 
Because was it taught this way also in your institute? Yeah, it was taught in Quran order. It was taught this way. And it, it, it is true that there are a lot of concepts that came up before that won't come up later. But that's okay. That's okay. That's just part of the journey with Quran. You're not going to learn everything in one shot. That's fine. And, and uh, you're calling it tafsir. I don't call it tafsir. That's just the first. I call it, it tafsir is kind of an exaggeration. It's really a basic walkthrough. To, through the Quran. That's the, I, in my th philosophy, that's like the first layer of Quran education the average Muslim should go through. Tafsir is on top of that. Tafsir, inshallah, pretty soon you'll see Surah Nuh, the tafsir of it posted on Bayina TV. That's tafsir. That, that one and a half surah, page surah took me 40 hours to teach. That's like two hours in ayah. <laughs> that, that's tafsir studies. What you're doing in, in the, the cover to cover series is you're just getting introduced which is the easiest thing and probably even the most important thing. You don't want to get into that kind of depth from the beginning. That's, it's not even healthy. It's not even beneficial. Just get through the whole thing first. And the other recommendation while I'm on the subject for, for any of you that want to have a long-term relationship with the Quran is there are, there's a surah you're studying. Sorry. There's a surah you're studying and there's the, you're building a familiarity with the entire Quran. So, it's okay to listen to lectures on the Qur'an without taking notes. It's fine. You're at least getting exposed to the concepts in it. Right? So studying a surah and getting familiar are two different levels of exposure. And you want to kind of maintain both. There's a kind of reading of the Qur'an you do just to be familiarized. You're not really studying it. And there's a kind of study where you're concentrating and you're saying, I'm going to memorize this, I'm going to listen to it a few times, and that sort of thing. And, so you, and when those two things are in parallel, long term you develop a really good healthy relationship with the Qur'an, inshallah. Okay, so that was the last question. Should I start talking to you guys now or just take questions? I'd rather just take questions, personally. If that's okay with you guys. Yeah? Uh, we have modules take uh, two years and ten months. So, what do you think is the appropriate age for students to start to introduce Qur'an to each other? And like, how do we go about it? We make it cumbersome for her, but in a process where she loves to, where she walks up to me and she says that I want to you know, um, two years and ten months, you said? Yes. That's tiny. Let her play. No, but what age? Uh, like, you know, because when we are doing with normal studies, then she started with numbers, she started with colors, she started with alphabets. So what if she has that kind of aptitude, then start her early. That's fine, but don't push it too hard, I would say. Yeah, also, uh, there's, a, there's a teacher that one of our friends here told us about locally uh, that actually I'm really looking forward to meet. I hope before I leave tonight, I meet her. Uh, she teaches three to five year olds uh, in this area, somewhere in Bahrain, I, it's a small place, so I, somewhere here, it can't be that far. Um, and she, her students, between three, she takes students from the age of three, takes them out by the age of five, and they've memorized two juz, which is amazing. And they love doing it too. So it's worth checking out resources in your area that are accomplishing those kinds of things. I, I'm personally intrigued for my own children for that kind of a resource. But f for my own children, I can tell you, I, I didn't, we didn't have the same standard for all of them. Some of them are really playful, some of them love reading, some of them have a love math and hate reading, and it's, they're different, you know? So we took a kind of a different approach with each. So, that's that. You have only child? Is that the only child? Oh, that's why. I see how like two, three more, you're like, uh, <laughs> it'll work itself out. <laughs> yeah? How do we stay steadfast with the Quran? For one week, I'm close to it, the other week. That's life, boss. So, I mean, how do I develop something so that. When I figure that out, I'll tell you. <laughs> that's all of us. You're going to have a good week, you're going to have a bad week. It's going to happen. But you, I mean, don't try to overdo it. That's the main, the biggest advice I can give you is don't try to overdo it. The good week you have, you really overdo it. And it's not sustainable. You burn out. You know, and then you start feeling guilty, then you go back and overdo it again. Then you burn out again, and the cycle perpetuates. Do little, but sustainable. It's not a burden on you to do it. It's not five hours, it's not two hours, it's 20 minutes. It's 50, start small and build up, right? If you can keep up 15, 20 minutes for six months, then you know what? You're qualified to move that up to 30 minutes. If you keep that up for six months, you're qualified to move that up to an hour and a half. You see what I'm saying? What we do is we feel bad and we just put in a couple of hours 
that feels really good, and then, God, I can't do that every day, you know? So that, that, that would be my probably my most practical advice on this subject. And this is actually inspired by uh, a hadith of Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. umuri adwa muha wa in qalla. The best deeds are the ones that are the most constant, even if they be little. Even if they be small in quantity. So that would be that. And by the way, guys, you don't have to stand up to ask your questions. So that's cool. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of times with me, what happens is when people praise someone or something, like, you kind of start developing an ego. Uh -huh. uh -huh. How do I battle that and have any of the Sahaba praise the person? Well, the Sahaba were really conscious of pride. They were very conscious of pride, radiallahu anhu ajma'in. And we should be too. And we should know the difference between uh, taking a compliment and making the most of it and taking a compliment and turning it into pride. Rasulullah used to praise Sahaba all the time, right? And used to praise things that we normally, you and I can't even praise. He used to praise like the zuhud of Abu Dhar Ghaffari who like the spirituality of a Sahabi. Like, how do you praise somebody's spirituality? That's like the, for you and me, it's like the worst thing you can do for somebody's spirituality. You can say, mashallah, your iman is so high. You have so much taqwa. <laughs> He was like, Astaghfirullah, you're ruining my taqwa, bro. <laughs> you know. But he did that, sallallahu alayhi wa Because there's a part of that, a part of giving someone a compliment is meant to encourage, is meant to appreciate. And as human beings, we actually need encouragement. We need validation and we need appreciation. This is a part of what we are. But if it goes too far, what does it become? You're, you're thirsty for it now. Nobody came up and said, that was awesome. Nobody came and gave me a, MashaAllah, this is the best thing I've ever heard in my life. What kind of people are these? I'm not coming back here. You know? If you become hungry for it, then clearly you have pride. Clearly you have pride. But you know what? When somebody, like for example, people come up to me and they say like, sometimes really over the top things, right? Yeah, so I mean, people come to me and say, you know, I heard this lecture of you and it completely changed my life. I'm like, well, <laughs> thanks. I do that. <laughs> no, no, I'm going to say, SubhanAllah, Allah changes lives. And if Allah made me a means for you to do that, I hope he, he, I pray that He rewards me for the good that you're doing. That's the first thought that I've trained to cr have crossed my mind. Somebody says, I changed my life because of something I heard from you. They don't realize they changed their life because Allah put something in their heart. And Allah made me a means. I have no ability on my own. The YouTube video has no ability on its own. You can hear a, th a million things and they don't affect you. And Allah decides one thing will affect you. And it could be something from out of nowhere. Like one of the most outrageous things that I've ever heard was from Sheikh uh, Abdul Hakim Murad. I was in, uh, I was in Oxford, and, or in, in London actually. And I had, we, we got a chance to drive up to Cambridge and meet with him. And we're just sitting in his house. He's a very eccentric man. He's a really high caliber scholar. And he takes like uh, uh, graduates from like uh, the Darul Ulum in, in England, many of them, and he trains them for higher Islamic studies. It's pretty cool. So we're sitting and talking and I kind of asked him, how'd you become Muslim? Because he's a really eccentric British man. Like he's like a proper like aristocratic guy that sips tea little by little and you know the kind of people you only hear about. He's got a, like a, one of those clock tower things in his house, grandfather clocks, and it's a really proper dude. I can't even call him a dude, it's a sir, you know? So he's one of those guys. I said, how'd you become Muslim? And his story is so outrageous. It's so insane. He comes from an extremely wealthy family. They traveled all over Europe for vacation, had no restrictions on, no religion in the family. And he went to, uh, he was with his brother on a beach. The worst kind of beach, I'm not going to spell it out for you. And he saw a woman and he became Muslim. Or he started believing in God that day. He goes, that, that much beauty, there has to be a God. And he started studying religions and came to his... Like, oh. And now he's a alim. And a hafiz of Qur'an. And... I'm like... Now I'm not telling you this story so you try, that, try your luck with that to build your iman. <laughs> But I am telling you that, you know, what I do or what somebody else does, the da'wah we do, the talks we do, the reminders we do, all of that are just simply means. 
the effect in them comes from Allah Azza wa Jal. For some people, they will hear it and it can help them. For some people, they will hear it, they'll hate it. They'll become even more averse towards deen, right? We have to remember that. The du'at have to remember that. The other thing I want to remind myself of and you of. So I come here and you know lots of people came to the masjid. Inshallah, maybe we'll see the similar numbers tonight. Allahu A'lam. People come and say, can I shake your hand? Assalamu alaikum. Can I take a picture with you? Can I take another picture with you? And then the people I don't even know they're taking a picture with me. They're standing behind me like, you know, and I see that on Facebook. This guy's behind me like this. Or, you know, this, I'm like, no picture with sisters. And the sister sneaks up from behind and tells the other one, come on, come on, do it. You know, my wife saw one of those pictures and emailed us. She was like, yeah, what's going on in What's going on in Bahrain? I was like, nothing. I was at the masjid. I was like, what kind of masjid is this? <laughs> I gotta go, there's a bad connection. That's what happened this morning. But anyway, so you know, when that happens, and uh, you know, obviously the volunteers are really worried like, oh, you have to take Ustad Naman Ali Khan away from the people because they're just climbing on top of him and we have to go, we have to go. And brothers, please stop, stop, stop. And there's a whole like this crazy paparazzi type scene, you know. And let me tell you something the only reason I would want to leave that place is. If we have like a meeting with somebody or an appointment and somebody's waiting for us and they have a right over us. Otherwise, I don't know when I'm going to come back and see you guys. I, I don't know. And if I get a, one chance to say salam to you, I will. And if that makes you feel happy, that's the least I could do. And I don't personally like taking pictures. I don't. I, I hate that actually. <laughs> but if somebody comes up to me and says, hey, can I take a picture with you? I say, yeah, yeah, it's okay. No problem. Why? Because I don't want to make them feel bad. Like. It's the only time I meet them and I act like, you know, no, it's haram. Don't you know you came here for the sake of Allah, not for the sake of a picture? And I start giving them a lecture, well, you know, they're going to go home depressed. Like this guy, I watched all his videos and this and that and finally got to see him and he treated me like garbage. That's not the time to give somebody a lecture. You just be considerate to their feelings and give them their time as much as you can, right? If it was up to me, I'd stay at the masjid until the last person leaves. Honestly, I would do that. I do that in, in the US all the time because we don't have the brother, 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 brother situation. We don't have that because I, I don't have an entourage in America. Nobody cares, right? But people want to come and ask questions and this and that if I travel to another city. And I stick around. I just, you know, give them time. Why? Why am I telling you this? Because as a da'i, you have to remember no matter how much attention you get, no matter how much praise you get, no matter how much special treatment you get, VIP lounge you get, whatever. You have to remember that you and I are there to serve people. They're not there to serve us. They're not there for, we're not the special ones, they're the special ones. We are, Allah has only honored us because we chose to serve them. You understand? You can lose sight of that very quickly. You can lose sight of that, you know? And you, that's why you have to make a lot of dua for people that are trying to do any capacity of da'wah. Any capacity of da'wah. Because if a person forgets that, Everything they do, none of it counts. Maybe people might even benefit. The only people who, the only person who won't benefit is themselves. It's all worthless at that point, you know. So you, this is something you have to constantly remind yourselves of, you know. And and alongside that, one of the reasons I wanted to meet with all of you, this is part of that, is I come and you know I'm in the hotel room, and then they take me out to a dinner. And then they, you know, they were having a good time or whatever and they sneak me into the masjid somehow and I go and I give my talk and I'm supposed to disappear after that. But all the volunteers that set up the tables and chairs and tested the mics and cameras and the, 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 the flyers and the advertising and the this and the that and there was a lot of people that did a lot of work, you know. And I don't see any of that. And the people who like woke up at what, two in the morning to pick us up from the airport? And they look like this. It's so nice to see you. Would you like some pizza? And I was like, yes. Oh, God, he wants pizza. Oh, God. <laughs> you know? But you know, you got to appreciate those people. You know, and I really appreciate you guys putting in this work because this is the point I want to make. You and I, you as volunteers and people like myself, we're actually on the same team. We're here to serve. I'm not in a better position than you are just because I got this mic with me. It's not, that doesn't put me in a better position. As far as Allah is concerned, we have come together to serve a larger purpose. Right? And some of us will be behind the scenes and some of us will be in front of, the, in, in front of a camera and in front of a mic. 
But none of that is actually putting anyone in a superior position to the other. Because all of us at the end of the day are doing something for the sake of Allah and that's what matters. That's what has value. If I come to a lecture and nobody's there, nobody's there, and I come to a lecture and 10,000 people are there, I'm not supposed to be like, what a waste of a trip. Nobody showed up. I'm never coming back here again. No, because I didn't come for people. I came because it's an act of ibadah. Like I could tell you one of my favorite trips, it's such a memorable trip. I went to a city in, in the United States called Duluth in Minnesota. Now Minneapolis is the big city. When I did a program in Minneapolis, not even Jumu'ah, at Jumu'ah there were 400 people at the masjid capacity. In my evening program there were 17, 1800 people. At, at the, they couldn't hold them in the masjid, they had to be in a convention center. Huge crowd. But there's another city in Minnesota called Duluth, very small community. So I went for Jumu'ah there. There were seven people in the khutbah at their jami'ah masjid. Seven people in Jumu'ah. It's the only masjid they have too. Tiny, tiny community. But I was really grateful to meet those people and talk to them about their challenges and how they're holding on to deen and how they deal with the fact that their children have nobody else to play with that's Muslim. How are they keeping the Islam with their family? I would have never learned from them, right? So you, you don't look at the material. Like for example, a lot of you put so much work into the last night's program and inshallah today's program and you're doing other efforts like running Saturday schools and other, other efforts, right? And you see nobody showing up or the numbers are not increasing. Right? Maybe that happens. Maybe it's a disaster, like the, like the sound system. It's a disaster. Don't be depressed about that, because you didn't do it for physical success. You put in your best, but you know these hours have been clocked, they've been counted by Allah Azza wa Jal. That's all I wanted. I got what I wanted out of this, because I did this for Allah, and it's done. So I know these few hours are in my credit for Akhirah. What, what tr troubles came that are beyond my control, the difficulties that arose, the, you know, whether people showed up or not, appreciated it or not, all of that stuff, none of that actually in the grand scheme of things matters. That's not what's important. It's the fact that we were able to give sincere time. So that, that's really one of the most important, I feel, messages I came to give you, you folks in particular. The other, the last thing that I want to share with you as advice, and I'll, I'll just take more questions from you guys is that when you do Islamic work in any capacity, when you are doing volunteer work for a masjid, a da'wah program, an educational program, a relief organization, any capacity, chances are that shaitan will try to disrupt the effort. And one of the most successful ways he can disrupt an effort is he creates tension between people who are doing good work. So in the middle of your projects, you will start talking to each other and the other will assume that you're being condescending in your tone or you're being disrespectful or dismissive or ignoring someone or overlooking their responsibilities and, or being too, too rude or too authoritative and there's going to be those kinds of tensions and you have to look out for them and crush them before they exaggerate you know because this is how people become disillusioned from volunteering and they say, I don't want to be there, I don't feel good about being there, I don't like how they look at me, I don't like how they talk to me, I don't like, you know, I don't want to be in this situation, I came there to do something for the sake of Allah, but I end up having quarrels with these people and arguments and, you know, dis disagreements all the time, I'm not interested anymore. That's a victory for shaitan, because somebody started giving up on doing something for Allah Azza wa You know, that's, that's not a good thing to have happen. You know, so uh, other than that, I have a few other bits of advice, but I want to hear from you guys more, inshallah, ta'ala, in this brief session. So, yes? When we read the Quran, I mean, obviously times are changing and we have different uh, problems emerging for the Muslim Ummah. When you, but you, obviously the Quran is applicable to any time. When you read about, say, the, the stories of the poems like Ad, Thamud, mm -hmm. these things, mm -hmm. how do we apply those to our lives? I mean, what bits and pieces do we pay attention to? <coughs> You, you can't be selective. I mean, what, what do you pay attention to in the Qur'an that's applicable to our lives, especially nations of old? They're not nations of old. They're, these are archetypes. Allah Azza mentioned evils of nations that are timeless. They're timeless. And the, the, every bit of every story is relevant. But we have to have that attitude when we study the Qur'an. Now, tadabbur, which is what you're asking about, reflection into the Qur'an, is a product of two things. At the first level, you have to have ta'allum. In other words, you have to know at least basic tafsir. 
If the tafsir athari even, like what does the first generation have to say about these ayat? Right, that's the basis, at least. What is the context of these ayat? What are the, what's the language of these ayat? That stuff you have to kind of know. Then tadabbur is built on top of that. Like your reflections and your thoughts and how this is applicable. And when you do have a thought, it's better to run it by an advanced student of Quranic studies or an alim. Like this is what I was thinking about when I thought of this ayah. What do you think? Does that make sense? It's good to validate your reflections with somebody who knows more or has got more experience. You know? And so that's a, that's a healthy exercise. And the more you engage in that exercise, actually the more you'll see. You'll start seeing things that weren't obvious to you before. You know? You had your hand up, right? Yeah? How do you bring your families closer to Islam? By being normal. You bring your families closer to Islam by not being a weird, strange, overly ag aggressive person. By not being out doing Islamic activities all the time. Be involved, but don't be too involved. Give family time. You know, you want your mom to get closer to Deen, spend time with her. If you're not spending time with her, how do you expect her to get closer to Deen? You want your younger brother to stop watching movies, play sports with him, take him out. Don't give him a lecture, go take him out for ice cream, man. Do something with him, you see what I'm saying? We have to be there for our family. And we have to be sincere in that. You're not there to give them a lecture. Actually, the last people they want to hear from is you. <laughs> they don't want to hear from you. My family doesn't want to hear from me. I can't give my wife a lecture. You know, unless I want her to go to sleep. Then, you know, and she does that. We're, you know, she, has, she, is, she finds it difficult to go to sleep when I'm not at home. She gets nervous. So she puts on one of my lectures. She goes to sleep right away. Right away. And she told, tells me too. You know? And it, because that's, that's natural. It's actually natural. You know? So, you're not there to preach to them necessarily. You're there to be there for them. And then the other things will, Allah will give the opportunities, give the, you know, the right occasion. Like even my mom, I, I tell the story, I think it's on YouTube somewhere. My mom, at first, says, I don't care what you say, I don't want to hear it. She, she came from uh, Al Jazair to America when they moved. And, you know, we get in the car from the airport in Oman. I know you give a lot of speeches and stuff, don't give me a speech. I don't care what you have to say. I was like, okay, mom, not going to do it. Okay, well, why are we on, okay, we're on radio, hey. So, um, I'm not going to repeat it, I'm not going to ask any questions. So I just put on a tape, a CD back in the day, like an MP3, and I make sure it's in Urdu, like a Mulana Tariq Jamil or something. Because it'll like, it'll, like, it'll like melt your heart, that guy, he could just get in there and just juice it. So I don't have to talk. I don't have to talk. And mom's like, and then she's in the back and she's just listening, listening, listening. And she's trying to talk to, you know, my sister and other conversation. But she's still kind of listening, kind of listening. And then I turn it off and she says, eh, put it back on. Like, okay. <laughs> Sometimes they don't want to hear from you. They want to hear from somebody else. Find the opportunity though. They're stuck in the car with you. <laughs> Might as well. And you're frustrated. Oh, they're still talking while the dars is going on. You should, they should be quiet and listen. No, they shouldn't. At least they got something. Maybe something went through. It's not going to be on your terms. It's going to be on their terms. You have to internalize that, inshallah ta'ala. You've had your hand up for a while. Um, I think you may have already talked about this, but I'm sorry. Could you tell me a little bit about you? I know you're American, how you started, and all that. Um, yeah. Tell me a little bit about your background. It's such a long, boring story how I started. It's so long and so boring. <laughs> it's, it's been said so many times. People watch this, like, God, again? I thought this was going to be a new YouTube video. <laughs> it's going to do this again? Ah, I hate this guy. <laughs> uh, a long story, really long story turned very, very short. I'll give you the bullet point version of this, okay? So I was uh, born in Germany. I was, um, I was there until the age of about six and a half, seven. I spent about six months in Pakistan and during which I learned Urdu because my first language was actually German, which I've lost at this point. I spent about s uh, seven years almost thereafter in Saudi, in Riyadh. And I went to a Pakistani school, an extremely Pakistani school, where I learned a lot of Urdu and played in the heat in the outside playground with, you know, a shirt tucked in with a tie, which is what you're, it makes complete sense here, with shiny shoes. We played soccer with shiny shoes on, and that's, it's supposed to be that way in the Khalij, right? So, <laughs> so <laughs> that's, that's how it works. 
Um, and so I did that for about seven years. Didn't learn any Arabic or anything at that time. Just kind of followed the Pakistani school curriculum that they have as a standard. Uh, then we moved back to Pakistan for another about nine months and I did almost end of eighth grade, beginning of ninth grade in Pakistan and then my dad got transferred to New York. And so about the age of 14 we moved to the United States and I, 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 I was in New York, I learned English the hard way at, by being laughed at constantly in New York. Went to high school there, went to college there. Uh, small detail but I kind of stopped thinking like a Muslim or acting like one or really believing while I was in high school. I completely lost touch with the religion. And um, I was that way in college too, and, and the first two philosophy courses I took didn't help. So they were kind of the icing on the cake. It really just put me over the edge. And it was, the, it was Allah's mercy and His gift, and the gift in the form of a really good friend that I found in sophomore year, second year of college, in, in Baruch College in New York City, that helped me kind of find my way back to the deen. And this wasn't through preaching, it was just through his good company. He just, he was there for me, that's all it was really. And just a genuine, genuine friend. N never actually told me to pray, but prayed in my presence. You know, and I just kind of eventually just grew on me and I just said, uh, might as well. Just, you know, haven't prayed in a while. I hadn't even prayed Jum'ah or Eid or anything for years. That's where I was. But so, you know, and through him I got introduced to some really inspiring young people. I still remember he took me to an MSA meeting. You guys know what MSAs are, yeah? Muslim Students Association. So he took me to an MSA meeting in Columbia University. I still remember. Baruch College is a small college and Columbia is a big Ivy League school and big deal. So he says, I want, I want you to meet some people. He took me to this MSA meeting. And there's a circle of brothers and sisters, right? And they're discussing what they're going to do this semester. The things that were, they were going to do included, we're going to sponsor an orphan from Bangladesh. They had his picture. They were going to raise this money among each other, not even ask anybody else for money. We're going to give da'wah to at least 500 people. We're going to raise the Palestinian cause and we're going to do so by telling, uh, talking about the atrocities that are happening to all of the clubs in Columbia University in collaboration with five other universities, most of which are not Muslim Students Association, like the chess club and the ping pong club and the, all those clubs. And they'll all sign off on it. And they, they pulled this off. And they had an anti-Zionism conference at Columbia University under the, and sponsored by it. And you had like a bajillion clubs mentioned underneath. And MSA was one of them, right? So you couldn't come after the, the MSA. And I'm sitting there going, my biggest concern was, am I eating pizza tonight or a fish sandwich? And these people are like, they're, they're serious, they're thinkers. They think beyond themselves, this is incredible. And they're my age. Why are they so cool? Why are they so, I mean, I was just mesmerized by these people, you know? And, and through them I got introduced to my dear, uh, one of my dear uh, uh, role models, Imam Siraj Bahaj, from Brooklyn, New York. We became really good friends. Um, and through, through him, I also got introduced to a masjid, which was actually very close to my house, but I never went there. Uh, the Muslim Center, where I met my, my Arabic teacher, uh, Dr. Abdul Samia. And my love of Quran and my love of the Arabic language was a gift of Allah to me through him, through that. So it's all of the things that went right in my life starts with a friend. All of them. I gave that talk yesterday, right? <laughs> it's all of it for me starts with a friend. All of it. And that, that guy, if you met him, you'd be like, that guy? Really, that guy? Are you sure? You, yeah, that guy. Yep. You know, you wouldn't know. You wouldn't be able to tell. He's, but he's an unbelievable human being. He's an incredible person, right? So that happened, and then fast forward again, graduated college, got married while unemployed. <laughs> uh, and got married in June, and come September, the 11th, <laughs> same year, you know, terrible, terrible time. I was in, I was in New Jersey at the time. And um, then I started, I moved back to New York thereafter and I worked at Islamic schools and worked at a masjid and worked at as, as a chaplain at a university, worked as an Arabic teacher at an Arabic professor at a college. And about 2005, I decided I need to just do this because I really love doing it, the, the Arabic thing. And it was a leap of faith. Who's going to come to Arabic classes? Who Does anybody enjoy going to an Arabic class? It's the stupidest thing I've ever heard. Most of my friends told me. I was like, no, I think I can make it interesting. 
I was like, yeah, you're going to make an Arabic class interesting, really? I was like, yeah, I think I can do it. So it just kind of started at this cra as this crazy experiment in New York, and it, word of mouth grew, and people started calling from Louisiana, and like California, and just all over, places I've never been. Like, can you do that? My cousin went to your class in New York. I heard it was pretty good. Can you bring it to our masjid over here in California? Can you bring it to Louisiana? Can you bring it to Tennessee? And I didn't advertise. It was just somebody's cousin, somebody's auntie, somebody's puppy. That just, that's how it worked, honestly. And I didn't even, I couldn't even afford to get a hotel to stay in another place. You know what I used, to, people who called me would actually give me a room in their house. I'd stay in their house for the 10 days that I would teach a class. It was like, it was ridiculous how hospitable people were. I still remember one of the classes I, I went to in Boston. It was the 10 days I spent in Boston teaching a class. And I didn't have any place to stay. And the brother who set it up himself was a bachelor. He had a one bedroom apartment. Right? It was one bedroom and a studio. Right? He said, I don't have any beds in my house. Sorry, I was like, eh, I'll do the couch. I lived on his couch for 10 days. And like years went by. Recently, I went back to Boston and he was there. I was like, you still got the couch? I want to sleep over. <laughs> he goes, no, I have children now, sorry. So I was like, <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> you know? So that, that's really where it kind of all started. And it's snowballed since, and it's, I feel like it's still just the beginning. Inshallah. A brother and then a sister will keep going back and forth. Yeah? Brother, how would you uh, recommend us to approach non-Muslims while giving down? Just be, be friends with them. You don't have to be preachy with them. You just, uh, honestly, da'wah, I think we use the wrong word. Da'wah is not the same as tabliq. Da'wah, the, the Arabic word da'wah means invitation. And invitation is a social act. It's, you, you feel comfortable enough with someone to invite them to your home. Da'wah is not done to somewhere else, it's done to your home. You understand? So when you call someone, you have to have the attitude that they're a guest. If you're not comfortable with someone like that, then you're not actually doing da'wah. You're simply spreading the message, giving them a message. That's actually tabliq. So da'wah is a personal relationship. A co-worker you can do da'wah to. You invite them over to your home. You show them what, you know, how you pray, things like that. You don't necessarily tell them to convert. You kind of work on it a little bit. It, it takes a time. Let, let people take their time. Let people come to it on their own. You know, don't push it too hard. You know? And then tabliq is, you know, you got an opportunity to see somebody at the train or at and the flight or something and you had a chance to talk to them and you gave them something about Islam. That's, that's an opportunity for tabliq. That may or may not come your way. And there's no one formula to do da'wah and there's no one formula to do tabliq. Because Allah didn't call to Himself in one way in the Qur'an, did He? وَكَذَلِكَ نُصَرِّفُ الْآيَاتِ We keep alternating the ayat. Different kinds of people need different kinds of messages. Even if at the end of the day the point is the same, God is one, accept His Messenger. Take responsibility for yourself because the Day of Judgment is coming. It's a simple message. But the way Allah explained it is such so many different ways He explained it. It tells us something. You cannot have one monotonous method of dealing with people. Allah respects the diversity of people in the Qur'an. We have to do that. We have to respect how everybody needs a different kind of discourse. Don't be formulaic in your conversations with people. Sister had a hand up. Yes? Regarding learning Arabic. Yeah. Unfortunately, although we live in an Arab country, you know, it's very difficult uh, when it comes to Quranic Arabic. Yeah. There are no proper courses set up, proper institutions set up. You wait two years. <laughs> or a year and a half, inshallah. inshallah. Then, you, then you see what I do, inshallah. 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 Give me a year and a half. Inshallah. inshallah. And the second question, we also have in al Fatih Masjid, we have a Dawah program. Mm. Yeah, 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 I know about that. I was at Discover Islam today. Oh, okay. So, do you have any advice? No, keep it up. Keep it up. Do that stuff. And actually, my only advice is, if you're part of the tour, crack a joke or two, funny one. Break the ice. Let them not be so scared of Muslims. Let them know we have, we're human beings, so we, we know how to tell a joke once in a while. We smile too. It's halal for us, <laughs> like, because they, they don't, because they, you know, honestly, what, how, what, what do people look like in the masjid? <laughs> Why are you so upset? You're at the masjid. Just be a little happy, you know? So we have to let, we have to put our, we have to bring normalcy back to our religion. You know, the, the, our religion is being 
uh, uh, misrepresented by people that are antisocial, <laughs> unfortunately. It's not how it should be. It's really not how it should be. You should be able to have a casual, easy going. You can talk to anybody. You know, you're, you're approachable. You're not intimidating. That's how a Muslim is supposed to be. He's approachable, he's not intimidating. Other people aren't afraid to talk to you. You know, Rasul anybody could walk up to him and start getting loud. And he didn't make people feel like I should back off. And he didn't do that. And even if people talked to him loudly and the Sahaba were about to take the guy's head off, he'd say, wait, wait, let the man finish. What are you doing? You know, so we have to be like that. We have to be approachable. So don't make your, I would argue, don't make your presentation too formulaic, make it natural. You know, strike personal conversations with people, ask them questions. So what do you do? What brings you here? That kind of thing. You know, if there are sisters in the program, hey, if you want to get some coffee later, you know, because if, if the outside sun isn't hot enough for you, I, we can <laughs> drink some more hot drinks. <laughs> you know, yeah. Uh, just, uh, when you're doing that, I mean, one thing that we face is like, uh, I mean, approaching, say, I'm going to be clear, like women, say, I mean, I generally don't do that. Do you shed some light on the boundaries of where we should stop? Like, you know, don't do it. There's plenty of women to do it. It's okay. Don't do da'wah to women. It's okay. They'll survive. I, I don't know how it's going to happen. I don't, I don't know. I, if I don't do da'wah to women, I don't know who's going to give da'wah to them, but I, I'm pretty sure it's going to happen. No, but we shouldn't, right? We shouldn't just because... No, I'm not going to say you shouldn't, but I, if you're not married and you're not... Uh, you're a young guy, then just watch it, dude. Just don't do da'wah to women, because it's not going to be da'wah after a while. <laughs> you know? <laughs> just don't do it. Just save yourself the trouble, and uh, um, and even for you know people like myself, etc. We can teach, and we I, I personally honestly believe in giving sisters equal rights to ask questions and to be able to to bring up their concerns, and I want to be able to talk to them as I talk to brothers. I honestly, and I believe in that. The bounds of respect are, you know, like if a girl comes up to me and says, "Hey, can I take a picture with you?" No, you can't. Just why not? My wife will kill me. <laughs> oh, okay. You know? Or even if my wife's not there, I was like, so this one girl came up to me. <laughs> Can I take a picture with you? I was like, yeah, go ask my wife. <laughs> she just ran away. She's like, <laughs> you know? So you have to, you don't have to be like, you know, make people feel bad necessarily, but you have to draw a line somewhere. You have to draw a line somewhere. And I, I personally do believe also for a lot of young people, they don't know what the lines are. They don't know where inappropriateness begins. Right? And you have to be patient with that, but slowly, inshallah, raise the level of maturity and awareness in our communities. Okay? Yes? Um, do you have any advice for high school dawah? Because I have a friend and she's a lone Muslim and I really love her and I hope she will go to heaven. Okay, so just, she, she watches you pray and stuff? Yeah. Does she ever ask you about it? Uh, sometimes. Okay, so just stay friends. And if, uh, you know, if like an event is going on or something, some easy going thing, then maybe you can show it to her. Or if you invite her to your house or something, uh, you can just play, you know, those Discover Islam DVDs? Like pop one of those and just kind of let her kind of see it. And even though you're not making her watch it, it's kind of on kind of thing. So you could do kind of indirect da'wah, little by little. And most of the time people become Muslim because of company. Not because of preaching. Re preaching is not what brings them to Islam. It's good company. It's, you know, you're, you're always there for them. They see that you're true to them in every way, in every sense, you know. And eventually there may be an opportunity where you can directly talk to them about Islam and things like that. And say, hey, if you don't mind, would you could you watch this video for me or something and you can give them like a Dean Show video or something a really good one, like pick a really good one or something like that maybe even not that's telling people to become Muslim like you know for example if you find one of my videos that's talking about like I don't know Surah Al-Asr or it's talking about Fatiha or something it's not even talking to non-Muslims but actually it is the message of Quran is for everybody you know there's a lot of Christians and a lot of Sikhs and a lot of Hindus who watch my videos they email me, they tell me I, I love this stuff it's brought me closer to God. And I say, rock on bro, do your thing. Because they'll come to Islam in their own time, right? So be, be indirect, but more than anything else, continue to be a good friend. And don't forget people like that in your dua. Yes? Some people 
Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullah. Yeah, because nobody else does it there. It's really hard when you go in a school environment. I would say look for a better school. Honestly, if there, it's, it's not, I'm not, it's, I don't say that lightly, but teenage girls, preteen girls, are some of the most impressionable, impressionable creatures on the planet. You know, so if she's reluctant to put her hijab on, now you can discuss it with her and try to encourage her and all of that, and inshallah that works. But the influence in school is a very powerful force. It's not, it's, you should not underestimate what that can do. It can do some terrible things, you know, so... You, you can't, yeah, you're, okay, so if you don't have really good schools, then you can't possibly be the only one who has that concern. That's impossible. I, am, I can almost guarantee you there's a, there's a thousand of you. And you need to start networking. You need to start a Facebook page. Yeah, so you need to come together. And if you don't know how to come together, there's this something called Facebook. It can be used for good things too. Start a page, Islamic School in Bahrain. Get people together, get ideas together. Do something about it, because it's not just about your child. You're leaving a legacy for other people's kids. Start a homeschooling network, whatever it takes. Because at the end of the day, if we're not there for our kids, then what are we here for? What's the point? What da'wah? <laughs> it's our own children we can't save. Look, uh, it's a hard question. How do we develop love for Allah and all of that? Like, like, let me tell you, it's a long answer. I don't know how much time we have left, but I, I recently talked about this for our children. How do we develop an, a personality for our children? Like, how do we give them a confidence and a sense of commitment to Islam that we don't have to watch over them anymore? They can carry it themselves, right? That kind of confidence in deen and they're sure of it, and they, they love it, and they want to live by it. Not because you're watching over them. It takes work, and it takes a kind of tarbiyah that unfortunately most of our parents don't even have. And it's something that, it concerns me to the point where one of my priorities this year is to develop something for 10, 11, 12, 13 year olds. Inshallah ta'ala. And videos aren't the answer, but at least they'll give you some guidelines so you can follow it up at home and do that. And I, I won't give you the entire discussion, but I'll tell you just one thing. We, at the age of 10, 11, 12, you want to actually develop a really thorough understanding in your children, a critical thinking type understanding in your children of why am I Muslim. Forget about what Islam is. What is Islam? What are the, how do you pray? How do you, uh, you know, what do you wear? What is halal? What is haram? All of that is secondary. Why do I care? Why am I Muslim? That's primary. And for, the mo for most people, the answer to that is because my parents are Muslim, because I'm in a Muslim country, because I'm in a Muslim school, because I don't know anything else. I don't know why I'm Muslim. Those are terrible answers. That's not <laughs> you should have like really deeply thought out answers to those questions, and our children at that age, 10, 11, 12, they're ready to start thinking about that. And we have to build that thought in them. And it, unfortunately, we didn't have that ourselves. Because we, when we were growing up, everybody around us was Muslim. Of course there's a God. Of course Quran is Allah's word. Of course the Prophet is a Prophet. Of course you're supposed to pray. Nobody questioned these things. We're in the age of questioning now. Everything around us is, even in the Muslim country, is being challenged, right? Even in a, in a school full of Muslims, Islam is being challenged culturally, right? So we have to build that foundation from the ground up. We are worried about hijab and not praying, and those are symptoms. Those are the, tr the fruit, the tree is not giving fruit. Well, the problem is there's, the roots have a problem. Fix the roots and you'll see the fruits. You see what I'm saying? 
So that's, that's really where, what my thoughts on this subject are. And it's, it, it's, I know this is not a sufficient answer, but it's something that's going to require a lot of work on my part, inshallah, when I get back, and uh, some of the colleagues that I have and friends that I have that have some really, I think, insightful thoughts on this subject. How much time do we have left? Five? 5.30? Really? Wow. Yes, sister in the back. Wa alaikum wa salam. Yes. Yes. Uh huh. You shouldn't abandon them. No, no, no. I appreciate the question. There's a difference between having a sadiq and having a qareen. Okay, so let me qualify my statement if it wasn't clear yesterday. You can't be their qareen anymore. You know what that means? You can't be in their constant company anymore. But do you have to be truthful and caring and in touch with them? Yes. On your terms though, not on their terms. On, on your terms. So invite them over, take them to a neutral place. Okay, so maybe they're into like some really questionable activities, but going to re eat at a restaurant is not that questionable. It's okay. You see, there are neutral places you can go that are acceptable to them and to you. That's good enough. But you stay in touch. You have to stay in touch. And you, you know, if they have some ounce of goodness in their heart, who knows, maybe Allah will reward you. Just that little, little, just you being there, you sitting there with them, that could be a reminder of Allah to them. Without you opening your mouth. Just seeing you, like, yeah, I used to pray. Just seeing you, you know? So that, that might be, serve as enough. That, that's what I mean by what I said. You're not keeping their company all the time. You're not. Yes. Wa alaikum salam. I have a question. I read I was talk, having a talk with my brother regarding atheism and believing in Islam. Yeah. Uh, he posed a very interesting question to me that I wasn't able to answer. Mm -hmm. He asked me, um, regarding, well, after studying the Quran, a few passages of the Quran, he asked yeah. me that if God has prepared eternal punishment for those who do not believe in him, how, is, how am I supposed to believe in a God that Oh, he didn't come up with that question. He read that online. Yeah, um, yeah how will God punish someone eternally for a finite crime, right? All of the questions about God, you have to you have to have a clear direction of the conversation about Allah. You know, these are. I'll get to the question. You have to build it from the ground up though. Do we know for a fact that there is a God? Let's leave the Qur'an aside for a second. Build the argument that there is in fact a supreme being and there's only one supreme being. That's the first step. The, and if once you get to that clearly, because there's absolutely undeniable evidence. Then second step. Do we know for a fact, without the shadow of a doubt, that what is in the Qur'an is beyond human capability? That can only be from a divine source. Once you build that, now you've built two things now. And therefore, the Rasul does not speak of his own self, he speaks of a higher, from a higher authority. Now if this foundation is built, then everything the Qur'an says, I don't have to prove its validity anymore. You understand? Because I've already accepted its supremacy through critical thinking. So the critical thinking applies to whether or not there is a supreme being and whether or not this is the word of God. Those are, you are free to be as critical as you want in these two spaces. Once you through critical thought reach these two conclusions, then you've actually accepted the fact that everything else in this book is beyond the cap capacity of your critical thinking. It becomes acceptable. These kinds of questions are a byproduct of the fact that these foundational questions haven't been answered. When these foundational questions get answered, they just, how come, how come there is a tree with, you know, that bites in Jahannam? 
How come there's a, how come we believe in a horse that has wings? Burak, how come we believe in that? How come we believe angels are made of light? And we, you know, we know they're made of photons then. How come we believe in, and you can keep going, and how come we believe a believer when he looks to the right of his grave and left of his grave, he can't see the end of it? How come we believe that? You know, how, how do we believe that a little part of a person who dies, a little part of it survives? you know, from their spine in the back, and then Allah raises them again from resurrect, on resurrection and from that. <laughs> Where's the scientific evidence for that? All of these questions will disappear. But unless you address these two foundational things, and by the way, once these two foundational things are there, he's a, the, you know, there is in fact an ilah, this is in fact revelation, he is in fact a messenger, sallallahu alayhi wasallam. Be critical about these. You know, you, and we have to be. That's what I'm saying, building that foundation I was talking about for 10 to 12 year olds. Critically reach this. Critically reach this. And once you do, then you know what? Everything else just falls in line. Yes, I absolutely believe in a horse with wings. Without a doubt. And here's why, because I've reached this conclusion. And let me show you how I reached this conclusion. Let's talk about that. And even that conclusion is not going to come in one shot. It's going to be long discussions about each of these things. You're going to have to really think about it. But you know what this does? It puts your thinking, it aligns your thinking in the right way. Right? It, it, uh, uh, the Qur'an isn't just information, it teaches us how to think. What conclusions we're supposed to reach, you know? And then beyond that, it completely makes sense. Then you don't have to justify, why do we pray five times, why are there three in Maghrib and four in Isha? You don't have to do it anymore. It's all done, taken care of. Give me a year. <laughs> yeah. By the way, for starters, on the first question, how do we know for sure there's a God? I want you to look up Mukhtar Maghrawi, Professor Mukhtar Maghrawi, on YouTube. Look up Mukhtar Maghrawi and the word atheism. It's 20, 25 minutes, but it's absolutely comprehensive. Yeah. Actually, brother's turn. Yes. Well, I took one of yours and one of yours. And one of, yeah, yes. Yes. Tonight's the last time. Uh, and we need to make sure that the lecture is one thing, but how do we follow up with our mortality as what are they supposed to do so that we can carry out? You have their contact information and things like that? You do? Give them gifts. Give them gifts. Like make, um, you have to be, as, a, as people that are trying to serve a community, understand that they came to this program, which is actually a favor they did to us. Okay? But don't expect them to keep coming to you. Which means you have to figure out a way of giving to them. So, you know, uh, appreciation, special, like, uh, uh, thank you and this and that. Some, some kind of maybe a CD or, I don't even know if you guys listen to CDs anymore, but whatever. Like some kind of gift, right, every once in a while. And some, uh, reaching and engaging the community and saying, hey, what did you guys think? What would you like to see more of? You know, what else would you like for us to do? What are some of your ideas? Engage people. Because my concern is in communities like yours, there's not enough engagement. There's not enough back and forth between people and people that die. It's like, what would you like us to do? What are some of your concerns? What are some topics you'd like to hear talked about? You know? And hear from people. Like hear from them. Take those concerns in and then create programs accordingly. And what, what you're doing then is you're bringing, giving to people what they're actually looking for. Right? It's not top down, it's bottom up. You know? So that, that, that would be a cool thing to do, inshallah. But don't, don't flood them with too many emails and things, because they'll just spam you and that's over. So every message you send should be very carefully crafted and not overly done. And uh, don't put too many things in it, just concise messaging. You know? Yes? Yes, young man in college, no. <laughs> but it depends on the situation. Like, I do dawahs to males. I wouldn't tell you that. <laughs> no, but I mean, how is it advisable? Uh, because... Uh, Look, at, you're right, it depends on the situation. situation. But I, I'm telling you, for the most part, for young men and young women, in college age, high school age, don't. Because I know how, you, how they think. And no. 
You're you're okay. You're cool. One more question. Unless you're in college. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. As they would to you. So what would you suggest to a grown up? <laughs> now, if you can't see that on the radio, I'm waving with a slap uh, for those who, girls who don't want to listen to their elders. But I, my suggestion to people in your position, if you have a girls group that you want to talk to and, and they don't pay attention, you should actually make most of your conversation about them, questions. What do you think about this? What do you think about your... Do you think your mom interferes too much in your personal life? What do you think about that? Do you think that you get too angry? Or what, what things make you really angry? Or what, what are some things that happened to you this week that you will never talk to your parents about? I promise I won't tell. You want to engage them, then engage them. Maybe if you're not going to be as successful as a speaker, maybe you're going to be more successful as a what? As a listener, you know, it's, uh, education is not about lecturing, education is about conversation. That's far more effective than lectures, by the way, far more effective. That's why I didn't want to give you a long lecture here, I just want to hear from you guys, you know. You again, no, with new, new faces, new faces, yes. What do you say about those people who become harsh to their parents because of their friends? Uh, they become harsh to their parents because of their friends? Yeah, because of their company, yeah. I say they better get their act together because hellfire is pretty hot. You don't mess with your parents. That's one of those things. I can't even beat around the bush with that one. I can't even be like, oh, go easy on them and this and that. Look, <laughs> your parents have been given such high value in our religion. Such high value. Allah, after mentioning Himself, He mentioned them. Understand in this ayah, when Allah talked about Himself, he, act, he asked for the bare minimum. What's the bare minimum we do for Allah? We do ibadah. The best ibadah is ihsan. Yes? The least you should do is ibadah. But if you do the best ibadah, it will be called ihsan. When He talked about Himself, He said, I've declared that you should do ibadah of Me. And I've also declared that you should do ihsan with your parents. Not even bir, not even goodness, not even hasan, ihsan. It's actually the best you can possibly be. You have to be excellence to them. And it's not even wabil walidaini muhsinan. Linguistically, wabil walidaini muhsinan is expected. What's in, in grammar we call this hal. But ihsan is a masdar. I know I'm getting technical with you. I'm only doing this to make you feel bad so you learn Arabic quickly. Okay? Ihsan is a mustad, it's the infinitive form, and the infinitive form is used in that place to say what you do with parents should exemplify what being good looks like. In other words, when you look up the word good to someone in the dictionary, there should be a picture of you acting towards your parents. Like the ideal goodness should be you know, directed to your parents. That's what's being said. In the most, in the most emphatic form, the language is incredible. It's not just saying be good to your parents. He's saying, exemplify goodness itself to your parents. So when somebody sees you with your parents, they say, that's what goodness looks like. Now, I, I thought goodness was this abstract idea until I saw this person with his mom or his dad. That's what the ayah is saying. It's incredible. And one of the other ayat, what's the ayah? Surah Al-An'am, SubhanAllah. That ayah about parents, oof. Uh, that is, it's scary. It's just scary. Allah Azza wa Jal mentions things that are haram. Things that are haram. And then mentions, وَبِلْوَالِدَيْنِ إِحْسَانًا 
Now, why does he mention things that are haram? You won't do shirk with Allah, you won't do this, you won't do this, and be best to parents. No, 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 all the negatives and then good to, goodness to parents. You know what that's, what that's ex, what's extrapolated? Anything short of, the, of being the best to your parents is actually from the most prohibited, prohibited things. Like it's, a, it's the only like standard in the Qur'an where if you don't do your best, you're in trouble. There is no other act of worship where you have to do your absolute best, otherwise you're in trouble. None. Salah is a work in progress. Dhikr is a work in progress. Ibadah is a work in progress. Learning is a work in progress. Goodness to parents and the best you can possibly be, anything short of your best and you are in major trouble. That's what Allah says in Quran. That's serious business. Now parents don't use that for your kids. Like, you use your brother Numan? Because if you use these weapons against your children, then it's like you want them to be in trouble. And you know what? They can be in trouble at school, at work, maybe even with the authorities. But getting in trouble with Allah is a different game. You don't want that for your children. Nobody should want that for your children. You shouldn't say to your children, Allah puchega tum say. You shouldn't do that. Because Allah, Allah wrote, you know, sanaktubu ma qalu. We're going to write down what they said. And if, you're, if your mother says, I hope Allah asks you about this, then you will be asked. Well, as a mother, as a father, you shouldn't say those kinds of things. Because you don't even know what you're saying. Like in, in, for example, I was told in Somali culture, a lot of moms, la'anak Allah. They just say it, just, the, the kid ran away with her apple, la'anak Allah. They don't mean it, but they say it. You shouldn't even say things like that casually. You know? You shouldn't say things like that casually. Jahannam ki aag. You know, don't do that because this is Allah is listening. You know, yeah. So how do you educate your parents not to say? <laughs> good turnaround. That was pretty good. How do you educate your parents not to say them kinds of things? Well, you take this recording and you kind of take that little clip and you kind of play it a little extra loud off of your phone while they're there and just hope. Or probably they won't even get it because it's in English, right? So I got to do this entire lecture in Urdu now. And then in Arabi because... There is an entire message of Islam that needs to reach our parents and it won't get to them in English. It won't. It's, it's scary, isn't it? So I've been thinking about that. I haven't done anything about it though. My Urdu is embarrassingly bad. Yes? Well, fundamentally, in the time, us being the children, even if, I mean, our parents do reach such a, even if they're saying things like that, I mean, we kind of exactly tell them don't say that. So we'll have to, on our part... Yeah, we can't talk back. Exactly. Oh, no, we can't talk back. Uh, could I just, one more question? No. <laughs> yes. Did I, is, is my pointing skill that bad? Okay. Uh, so I'm Sure, sure, sure. Now it's very kind of, uh, it, it has kind of a point where the student himself can lose track of the, the whole message of monotheism. And a lot of uh, men kind of, so I would say some people actually become atheist at the end of finishing their degree because of this. Because we're kind of encouraging people to go and analyze things and take these. I go back to my same problem. If the foundation was built, this would be a laughable matter. Then you'd study that stuff because you, want, you needed a good laugh. When the foundation isn't built, these weak bodies of literature can destroy your faith. Is really that weak? Is, our, is, the, is, is Islam itself really that weak that we can read a couple of articles, philosophical articles, and it's gone? How is it that Allah says in Quran, Ad'u ilallahi ala basiratin? I call to Allah with eyes open. Every faith asks you, believe blindly. Just accept it. It's a matter of faith. It's in your heart. Accept the mystery. Our faith says, open your eyes and look. Be critical. Come to this conclusion. We have abandoned thought. We have abandoned critical thinking in our faith. To build it. 
We, and so I didn't want to get into this conversation, but since it's come up twice now, I'll just give you one thing. Our Iman, our faith is two things. It's spiritual and it's intellectual. Okay? So you have good days and bad days of Iman. It's, it's a spiritual reality. And there's an intellectual foundation. Now I argue that the, the intellectual foundation of our Iman, that is built off of really serious thinking and discourse. It's built gradually and it's, it, when it gets to a point, it never goes down. The intellectual Iman. Above that is our spiritual Iman. Okay? Now the problem with education in the Ummah today, all of it, not just Bahrain, the entire Ummah today, we abandoned the process of building intellectual Iman. We assumed that you will inherit Iman. You're a Muslim family, why do you need to build Iman? That's what we assumed. That assumption is lethal, it destroyed us. So what happened was we had no intellectual foundation. And so when people started asking critical questions, we thought they're having spiritual problems. Now I told you there are two kinds of Iman, there's the, spiritual, there's the intellectual foundation, uh, on top of that there's the spiritual fluctuations, right? People bring up philosophical problems and the, the, the da'i says, listen, you're getting waswasa from shaitan, make wudu, to pray, pray to raka'ah, slaughter an animal, this, you know, they're telling them spiritual solutions to what is actually what? An intellectual problem. And yes, there may be a spiritual problem on top of that, there may be. But if you don't address the intellectual problem, and you only think there's a spiritual problem, then you're going to actually further the intellectual problem. Because when a child comes, and I've met families like this, a, a son, you know, one day in America, this mother came crying, and she, like, she called me for like an hour, she wouldn't get off the phone, my son left Islam, my son left Islam, he doesn't want to be Muslim anymore, I was like, what happened? He goes, you know, prove to me God exists, prove this, prove that, prove the other, I told him make wudu, I told him, you know, I took him to the Imam, he, you know, blew on him and nothing happened. He's still like, he's still asking those questions. All Ramadan I prayed. I told him to pray. He even prayed. I said, I don't feel anything after I pray. And I, I told her, uh, well, if you, if he asks you philosophical questions and you come back with pray to raka'ah, he's going to say, that means you have no philosophical answers. So you're validating his concern. That's number one. Number two, I said, what's her name? And he said, no, my son. I was like, no, you didn't understand my question. What is her name? <laughs> and she, t she, she was quiet for a while and she told me, it's Jenny. <laughs> this witch have, hasn't left my son for three years. <laughs> because you don't just wake up one day a Muslim, Muslim and I want to be an atheist. Something's going on and usually <laughs> I, I, I've been around enough to know. So, you know, there's some emotional baggage too. And you have to be honest about that because when people bring up philosophical problems and you break them down, when you break down their philosophical problems and you crush them, you know what they say? But you know what? I can love whoever I want. But you know what? Why did Allah do this to me then? That's not an, that's not an intellectual criticism. You've got, you got an emotional problem. So when you actually break down the intellectual facade of atheism, then what you expose is people with emotional disturbances. That's what you actually expose. Are you saying that Richard Dawkins is Absolutely. Absolutely. I think he would be very, very family. He would. Let him. I'm not interested in debating those people. I don't care about debate. I, I don't care. I'm interested in talking to young people. I've talked to enough young people to know. I'll give you another story. I got an email last week from Bombay. This guy wrote me a 20 question email. Horrible things about Rasul Sallallahu in the first. Terrible things about the Quran. How can I believe in the Akhirah? How can you, exact same question. How can hell be eternal if my crimes are limited? How can there be a God of this and that? What about predestination? 20 questions. I answered a few of them and I said, there's something else going on. He goes, nothing else is going on. These are intellectual questions. You just failed to answer me. I was like, fine. I'll talk to you a month. He emailed me just two, three days ago. He said, my wife and I have been trying to have a baby for five years. We haven't been able to have a baby. And I started blaming Allah for it. And just two days ago, we found out that she tested positive, we're having a child. And I thanked Allah and I'm really sorry for the mean emails. <laughs> I didn't solve your intellectual problems. 
I didn't. We just, he had some disturbance. These aren't philosophical, like, I'm not pulling this out of thin air abstracts. These are real case studies of people, you know. One of my dear friends in, in the US, uh, Professor Omar Muzaffar, I don't know if you know him, if you don't know him, you should, you should follow him on Twitter. You know he's silly on Twitter, but Omar Muzaffar, really cool guy, just absolutely cool guy. And he deals with people like that all the time. He teaches Islam as a worldview at the University of Chicago in the master's degree program. When people come to him with atheism, agnosticism, Muslims, all the time. And you, after a couple of hours of conversation, all that comes out is, look, I just feel bad. Somebody made me feel really bad because of Islam. My mom made me feel really bad that I have a girlfriend. And I figured my relationship with my mother has been ruined because of this Islam. If it wasn't for Islam, my mom wouldn't be angry. And I could keep my girlfriend and I could be happy with my mom. Everything would have been fine. The only problem in my life seems to be Islam. I don't like Islam. That's what that is. SubhanAllah. You know, we have to address the problem for what it is. But I'm saying, inshallah, if we build that foundation properly from the beginning, atheism is stupid. It is. There's no other way to look at it. It's stupid. There's overwhelming evidence. And it, I'll tell you one more thing. You don't have to go to the Quran to refute athe atheism. Quran doesn't even want you to go to Quran to refute atheism. Allah Azza wa Jal tells us, Inna fi samawat, oh, what's the ayah? It's in Surah Al Jathiyah. Actually, from the beginning to end, Surah Al-Jathiyah is like that. But one particular ayah in Surah Al-Jathiyah is Allah Azza wa created the skies and the earth. Inna fi dhalika uh, uh, la ayatin lil mu'mineen. Actually, it's the well, second ayah of Surah Al-Jathiyah. It's right there in the beginning. Inna fi samawati wal ard la ayatin lil mu'mineen. The skies and the earth, no doubt, have in them enough miraculous signs for people with, that are seeking absolute conviction. Allah is not saying seek absolute, absolute conviction from Qur'an. He's saying seek it from where? Skies and the earth. Seek absolute conviction from the skies and the earth. Without a doubt, you'll find it. Maybe we're not thinking about the skies and the earth properly. Maybe you haven't learned the proper thought process. Maybe there's something missing in our thought. And if we had it, it is built. It's set, you know? Uh, five minutes. Five minutes. Your question. Reciting Quran is very important for Muslims, but are there many Muslims who are not reciting Quran? Like, how is it like can we invite them for, you know, and praying to recite Quran? Reciting Quran is really important. Um, understanding why you should recite Quran is more important. Is there any specific number, like in a particular area, supposed to recite once, twice, or twice? No. And the people who aren't reciting Quran have other issues. I think there are more fundamental issues. And when you address them, inshallah, reciting Qur'an will come. But for da'is, for activists, for volunteers, you better be reciting Qur'an every day. Don't volunteer if you're not reciting every day. Do that instead. I'm telling you. There's no point volunteering if you're not reciting Qur'an every day. I mean it. For, for activists, yes. For volunteers and activists and Islamic workers, absolutely. Yes? You're going to laugh at this one. Pray sincerely. <laughs> uh, the advice I have for praying sincerely is, um, why is there an insincere prayer? I don't understand how you can pray insincerely. You mean like con with a, a concentration filled prayer? Like a, oh, that's not sincerity. It's, different problem but okay so if you want to pray sincere or, or with concentration there's lots of advice I think Saleh al-Munajjid had a really nice list of tips to build sincerity I, I, I don't have to reinvent that look that up it's pretty cool Saleh al-Munajjid now wait brother turn my paper still says five minutes yes Wa <laughs> Yeah. So, what, what you will say for him to go, like, to select a jamaah? What you will guide Stay away from that stuff. Just learn your deen first. 
Stay away from the Jamaat business. It's too, it's too much hassle. I'm telling you from experience. Just, it's not for you. It's not for you. So like what we can do? For you can support good causes. You want to do, be active, take a project and support that. You don't have to be in a Jamaat to do that. Okay, if, they, if there's a group and they're doing good work, support their project, help them with that. Be project-based instead of group-based. You understand? If a cause is worth supporting, you should be in it. And you know what? One group will have one good cause, another group will have another good cause, but if you join one group, guess what? You're like, oh, no, no, that's not my group. I don't want to help. It's, it's, a, it's unhealthy. It's unhealthy. We learned this the hard way in New York City. Literally, people, sincere young people, joining one group, another group, another group, and there's a group rivalries. That's not what the Soma is about. Right? But if there's a, it's, it's a good project be happening here and you can help, help with that. My recommendation to you is find your strength. Are you a good educator? Are you a good programmer? Are you a good writer? Are you a good administrator? Are you a good networking person? What are you? What are you good at? And then take that and help a good project with it. That's what you should do. That, that's enough. You're doing something good. Last one, yes. I talked about this actually pretty extensively. Uh, if you, you know, on, our, on, on Bayina's website, if you go look up the podcasts, Surat al-Baqarah, look up ayah number 177. It should be a separate download or two or three downloads. Just that discussion itself. The difference between people who want to be ethically good as opposed to religiously good. And how there's a distinction between them, right? So if some people pray and they, they wear hijab or they grow a long beard and all of that, but they're really bad at business and mean to their neighbor and just ethically bad people. And then there are people who are ethically really, really good, honest business people, they stop at every stop sign, they stand in line even though everybody else is cutting, but they don't pray. Right, so you've got two definitions of good, ritualistic good and ethical good. Ayatul Bir addresses this problem. It gives us the comprehensive answer to this question. Uh, 177. 177. That was the last one. Okay, fine. Uh, just, what's your advice for, like, I don't know how to put it, but like conscious sinning? Like, for example, in my workplace, in my house, with regard to non Muslim. So there's a lot of, I don't know, that's not the reason, but there's a lot of, like, talking about people behind their backs or just inappropriate jokes things like that that go on throughout the day and your workplace and this and you're conscious that you know it's not right for you to engage in but it's also your colleagues and your whatever that are taking place so you can either isolate yourself and be like distant from everyone or or it's not everybody who does it there's one or two people that are just really outrageous and you identify them and you pull them to the side and take them out to lunch and say look uh, I get a little uncomfortable when you talk about this or that and I, I don't want to say it in front of everybody but I respect you a lot as a colleague. I respect you a lot as an older brother, whatever it may be. But I mean, if you could just kind of help me out with that, I'd appreciate it. You know? Yeah. I think you, it's not something you can address an entire family with or an entire company with, but you can take individuals and kind of respectfully bring that concern up and it can help the environment. But at the end of the day, you can't change people. You have to just, it's a tough world. We just got to live in it, you know? Okay, I'm going to go now. Can I go now? I go now. You said no. You have one last question? After two, this, my last question was two questions ago? Okay. I already convinced him. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's done. It's done. For our sisters, 15 minutes. 15 more minutes for sisters? It's a special request. <sighs> It's here. Assalamu <sighs> <Sound like> guys. <laughs> Slowly. Take care. Yes. I don't know. No, it's too late. I already said it loudly. Sure. Okay. 15 minutes starting now. Just don't give more.